They call him High Rise Harry. Harry Trigoboff is one of Australia's richest self-made men. So what's it like to be a $10 billion man? and welcome to One Plus One, I'm Jane Hutchin. Harry Trigoboff came to Australia as a young migrant. He was never impoverished, but through hard work and learning from his mistakes, he began a company that bought parcels of land and built apartments. Now, more than 50 years later, the octogenarian businessman who founded and still heads his company, Meriton, is still doing it his way. He's currently Australia's third richest person, according to the 2015 BRW Rich List, with personal wealth estimated to be above $10 billion. Harry Trigoboff, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you. We are sitting here in one of your penthouse locations overlooking Sydney. You are one of the wealthiest people in Australia and your wealth has grown to more than $10 billion according to the BRW Rich List. I wonder, as we look out across different parts of Sydney from where we are, do you feel that you've had a hand in the way the landscape of Sydney has changed? Well, since I'm not a modest person, I say I had the biggest hand in it. Uh, the biggest because, hand? Because I devoted myself to Sydney. I did a little bit in Queensland, but basically I'm Sydney. And I started with the first units in uh, 1963. There were very few units built there, so that's when I started. As you look out from this incredible location, do you feel proud? I feel very proud. I am proud that when we started, it was all in a very small way. Two stories was what we built. Four stories required a lift, so we didn't do those. Three stories, people preferred with a lift, so we didn't do those either. So we started a very, very modest way. But I guessed correctly, there was a big demand, and the demand has only grown with supply. Do you remember the first financial risk you ever took? I think that I never take risks. In my mind, there is no risk. The great risk in Sydney is the town planning department. That's the risk. You don't know what they'll do or the councils will do. As far as the building part, there is no risk. What about in your early life, when you were just starting out? Can you remember ever taking a risk, something that made your heart stop? Don't think so. Really? No, don't remember. It must have happened, but I don't remember. Your parents had to make a huge sacrifice to get out of Russia. They moved to China, which was a haven for Russian Jews at the time. Were you brought up with this sense of gratitude and persecution being always at the back of you? I never felt persecution. I am sure that it happened, but I never felt it. I didn't see it. See, I think a person only feels when he sees something. But did you get a sense of your parents having been persecuted and fleeing Russia? Did right. they tell you stories about that? I considered it lucky that they were in China rather than in Russia. And many years later, I brought to this country 32 relatives of mine from Russia. So I then realized how lucky I was that they got out into China and afterwards got out into Israel, and I was here. So I was like, I considered myself lucky. Did you consider yourself lucky as a small child growing up in China? Because there was a lot of hardship going on around you. There was the Japanese invasion in the 1930s, there was civil war, and finally the communist takeover. It wasn't exactly a peaceful time then, was it? Were you aware of those things going on? Sure. I didn't feel much about the early part. I felt it at Pearl Harbor, right. So that's when the Japanese 
occupied Tianjin where I was a child growing up. But the Japanese were good to us, the Chinese were good to us. See, Russia was not at war. Russia was neutral. So really the war years for us Russians in China were very good years. The hard part was before the war when there was the Great Depression in the world. And you imagine my father, he didn't know Chinese, he didn't know how to read or write English, he knew Russian and he knew Yiddish. So it was very hard for him, that's for sure. But I was a small child, I didn't understand that. So what were your impressions when you first stepped off that plane in Sydney with your brother in 1948? First of all, I was so excited that I felt ashamed. I thought I had to be with my parents. I was here with my brother, and I only looked at the future. So I felt really ashamed, but I couldn't help my excitement. Here was a country I came to that there were all white people. I never saw so many white people in my life. I looked at Bondi Beach, bronze bodies, unbelievable. I looked at the red roofs, no flats, cottages everywhere. Superb, I couldn't believe it. So they took me, the first day I was here, they took me already on the Harbour Bridge. I crossed the bridge, I never saw such a big bridge. We had a bridge in Tianjin, it's a small bridge, it's a big bridge. Very good. So I was very, very impressed. I didn't know that there was London or New York. For me, this was London and New York all in one. Why did you say that you felt ashamed of being so excited? Oh, because I thought I should be feeling sorry for them that, that I came here. Still, I, I understood the problem of a parent that had to send his child here because the, it was very dangerous for them as communists were coming in. Right? And uh, they had good reason to to believe it was dangerous because there's not one person from those times is still in China. My parents, they went to Israel. We were lucky that Israel was established just in time for them to get out. In your early years, you spent time in the UK. I think you studied textile engineering in the UK. You worked in Israel for a while, you worked in South Africa. That's before you came back to settle in Australia. Can I ask you, were you looking for a homeland or did you just like to travel? So when I finished school here, by that time my father started a business in Israel. And in his mind, in my mind, I only had one thing to do, to work with the father. So we had a textile factory. So to work in a textile factory, he sent me to Leeds. That's where I learned all about wool. And I studied there for three years, went with my father. I worked with my father and my brother. I didn't get on with my brother. My brother didn't get on with my father. The father didn't get on with me. A happy family. We loved each other, but we couldn't work. Right? So then the father said, I sent you when you were a kid to Australia. I'm sending you back. So <laughs> the Australians wouldn't let me come back. I don't know. Our immigration department is no piece of cake, I promise you, when you're outside. So <laughs> it took me a year to get the visa back. So that year I spent in South Africa. And uh, when I came back, I explained to them that I was really entitled not only to enter the country, but to have citizenship. They immediately made me an Australian, so that was very good. So I thought it was good. And uh, I stayed ever since here. You sound like you had quite a complex family life. Did that get reconciled as you got older? Did your father, for example, live to see your success? He saw the beginning, yeah. Yeah, he did. He died when I was already probably eight years in business, yeah. Very good. Was he proud of you? I think he was surprised. <laughs> So was I. <laughs> Why was he surprised? Because he thought he was the clever one, you <laughs> see. And he looked upon me as the one that's arguing all the time. I mean, some, uh, some people in this country think I'm, some politicians still think I'm arguing. 
they forget that they have to fight each other. They fight me <laughs> when when they need me and I need them, but they fight me. You see, so it must be in my blood. I fight <laughs> them. You see, so he he was surprised that I succeeded, but anyway, he was very proud. Yeah, sure, and he, he told me to help my brother. And anyway, I couldn't help my brother because he didn't like the conditions. So then I didn't help him. But anyway, we, we were great friends. You came back to Australia, as you said, you got your citizenship. I've heard that you ran a taxi fleet, you earned a milk round, and you sold real estate. That's a lot of different kind of jobs. Yeah. Why did the real estate win out over the taxis and the milk round? So I came here and I tried to get a job in textiles. So I knew some friends that were in textiles and they told me, if you're good, you'll be better than us. If you're bad, we have to sack you. So they didn't give me a job. So, all right, can't give me a job. I had enough money to buy a cottage, but I didn't do that. I invested my money in Milkran, in taxi. I bought a block of four flats and I did, and I worked. I mean, for my job, I got 20 pounds a week. For my investments, I got a hundred pound a week, so I'd lived very well. Mind you, there was no capital gain in those days. <laughs> you bought for a hundred dollars, you sold for a hundred dollars. But anyway, I did okay. So I had a friend who was told that he, he should go into building. Because I was already a salesman in, in real estate, I understood what people wanted, which is the main thing. Always understand what people want. So I took him and we bought a block of land and uh, I built it and it was very successful in the first time I ever built. So I thought, well, that's very good. So even before I finished, I already bought land for another two blocks. And so I went, kept on multiplying. And that's how it happened. So you said that you always understood what people wanted. Yes. How did you get that skill? Oh, well, I watched them and I tried to understand what makes sense. So I saw these young women here when I started to build and they got very low wages. And I understood that the only way they could figure out security was to have a home. I could see it in their eyes. I could deliver apartments which were a lot cheaper than cottages in areas which were much closer to the city and better. And there was no competition. So I thought this is where I should go. Logic, right? Fast forward nearly half a century and your company, Meriton, has built tens of thousands of dwellings. You are now Australia's biggest residential property developer. You have said that the Australian dream of a quarter acre block is trading up to a penthouse in the centre of town. Have you helped craft that new Australian dream? Of course. The newspapers were always against me in the beginning because they thought that I was depriving people of what they wanted. I disagreed with them because the people were paying the money. I mean, those it's very easy to write a story, but if a person pays everything he has and borrows everything he can to have an apartment, then I was correct and they were wrong. As time went on, I was proved to be correct because the movement is towards apartments now. But my problem is is the problem of the community that the apartments cost too much, cost too much, whereas cottages are a lot cheaper. Logic says apartments should be cheaper, not cottages. But the way it works, this. So that is why I have these arguments with the planning department, because they cause the costs to be so high. And I will win because I'm logical. They're not logical. He's proving to me that he's the boss. But five years ago, in August 2010, you proposed that the federal government should insist on making the RBA drop interest rates to improve housing affordability. 
Yet here we are today, interest rates are extremely low, but housing for many Australians is still very unaffordable. How do you feel about that situation? Well, I did all I could to fight the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank agreed with me in the end. Logic, if everywhere in the world the interest rates were very low, why should we have them high? Suddenly we decided that we are a bigger risk than others. If I thought we were a bigger risk, I wouldn't be here. So I proved myself right. No. But now you don't hear me talk about interest rates because they're, they're good. Uh, they might be a bit lower, a bit higher, but that's irrelevant. They, they, we've got them where we want. And it looked impossible. But we've done it. C could you imagine if the interest rates would be higher? First of all, there'd be no building at all. <laughs> but house prices are still hardly affordable for a lot of Australians. Do yes. you, do you have a, a sense about that? Does that make you feel regretful in any way? I tried all my life to make housing affordable. The more affordable the house, the more money I make. It's not the less affordable I make, because if it's unaffordable, he can't buy much. I deal in volume. To sell volume must be affordable. So that's my whole life, is to make it affordable. So I did it with interest rates. Now I have to do it with the planning now. But if I can address you as Mr. Trigoboff, the great-grandfather, you have a great-grandchild, you have grandchildren, and you have children, a lot of Australians would say, maybe not from your family because you've done very well, but a lot of Australians have a sense of unease about the future. There's an uncertainty about jobs. They find housing unaffordable. Do you share that sense of unease? There is a lot of unease and they have every right to be uneasy. And that's got nothing to do with governments. That, that just is the way it is, in my opinion. 30 years ago, a person got a job and he thought he would have that job forever. Today, he gets a job, there's technology, they, they sack him, he can find another job, mind you. If he wants a job, he gets it, there's jobs around, no problem, but he's uneasy. In the old days, he thought if he joined the railway department, he would die in the railway department. Right. Now, the old people are also uneasy. They don't know how long he'll live. He doesn't know how sick he'll be. So hockey got a problem, and, and, and he can't fix it. It's the way the world is. I make it very uneasy. And don't forget, even though I think that I'm so wonderful, I do have a lot of responsibilities, and I do have half-finished buildings, and we've got to finish them one day. So I depend on the market being what it is. That's the unease. Let's talk a little bit about courage. I was thinking about this interview and I wondered to myself, what does somebody give one of the wealthiest people in Australia as a present? And I found these. They're fortune cookies. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Shall we crack a fortune cookie together? Yeah, very good, very good. Oh, you've got good eyesight. Well, to do <laughs> two things at once is to do neither. That's good advice. Very to do advice. two things at once is to do neither. Very good advice. Yeah, I agree. An ounce of gold cannot buy an ounce of time. Correct. This is time a... is all we have, and we lose every day. Why I gave you the fortune cookie was I was wondering whether in your life you consider that luck and chance have played important parts. How do you respond to that? Definitely important. But... To be lucky, you have to be there. To succeed, you have to work hard. And you must fix, you must pick the right subject where you want to work hard. So, you must also be good at what you do. And you must be happy at what you do. If you have all those things, you'll succeed. You said before that you have to have a lot of things lined up for you to succeed, what would you say your one special skill is? The skill is have the right people. They must be happy at your work. If somebody is unhappy in my business, I throw him out on the spot. doesn't matter who he is. And I don't need him sulking there. If I can't change him, no good to me. I'm no good to him either. I, I failed and he failed, in my opinion. 
So everybody must be happy, have to work hard, has to be consistent. That's very important. If you can get consistency, then you will win. To get consistency, one must be very agile. Most people are not agile because they owe money, they got partners, and they got shareholders. I got my money, I got no shareholders, and I got no partners. So therefore, I can move a lot quicker than they can. I can say something today and do something completely different tomorrow. And nobody tells me, but you were wrong. Mr. Trigobov, what do you find challenging about being wealthy? Find challenging? Very nice to be wealthy. I'm very happy. I don't spend much money, mind you. Nothing like others. Really? I have no time to spend it. I have too much fun working. <laughs> I want to spend money a lot. So, I, for me, money is not what I spend it on. For me, money is what I can do with it, right? So if I have more money, I can build more flats. If I have more money, I can do more things. Um, I think I'm lucky if you have money that I can have good uh, health service. I mean, to, to pay doctors and things, you have to have money. That's very, very important. In fact, I think the first thing you should do with money is to make sure that you're healthy. Use that money for your health. But that doesn't require big money, thank God. I'm, I'm well, I'm healthy. But surely if you had a lot less money, you would have a lot less responsibility in a lot of ways. That's what I was trying to get at by, by challenging. Are there aspects to having a $10 billion empire that you know you wish you just didn't have? No, no, it's good to have $10 billion. Let's have $100 billion. Why not? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's good fun. Good fun. You must look at it that way. People tell me, how do I take all that pressure? I say, I give the pressure to them. Don't worry about me. <laughs> like off a goose's back, don't worry about it. <laughs> if, if I couldn't take the pressure, I wouldn't start. So you, of all the billionaires on the BRW rich list, I think you jumped the furthest in the last 12 months to more than $10 billion. You mix, obviously, with a lot of other quite wealthy people. Do you learn from other billionaires? Really, I don't mix with many of them. Really? No. I mix with my workers. What do I need those billionaires for? They're old people, they talk to me about the past. Uh, young people I want to talk about the future. So I really don't, but I do read about what they do. Of course I do. And I see the mistakes they made, and I admire the good moves they made too, it's all kinds, you see? So there you are. Do you consider yourself powerful? If you were to pick up the phone this afternoon to Tony Abbott, would he pick up on the other end? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Which bit never? You wouldn't call him or he wouldn't, he wouldn't pick up the phone? He wouldn't pick up the phone. He wouldn't. Oh, he has nothing against me. Nothing for me either, by the <laughs> way, but no, he wouldn't. he wouldn't talk to me. You have a rabbi come to your office twice a week. I wonder, has religion, has spirituality become more important to you as you've got older? Not much. I go to synagogue three times a year. I went that way with my father. So I continue the same tradition. I never learned how to pray properly. But I think uh, I get on with the God. He's looking after me, so I, mean, I have no complaints. Do you feel a sense of contentment, a sense of satisfaction, or even, dare I say, happiness at this time of your life? I am extremely happy. I'm happy, first of all, to be alive. Because at my age, when I was a young fellow, 60 years old was about the limit in China. I never saw anybody past 60 in my life. So to be alive, I'm extremely happy. To be healthy, even more healthy, happy. And that I have wealth, very good too. Because I think I use the wealth properly. I use it for the benefit of everyone, including myself. What do you say then to people who say that money doesn't make you happy? I think they're stupid. I've never seen anybody give money back. <laughs> do you think it's important as someone who builds 
buildings, who builds high-rise buildings, to build beautiful buildings. Very important. But in my case, I have so many responsibilities that I cannot just stand back and look at beauty. So for that purpose, I have the best architects in the world. And I leave it to them. I think they've done a very good job. I think we have a very outstanding town planner in the city of Sydney, extremely successful. He, he, in fact, I gave him some jobs when he was a young kid, so he, he's very good, and I think we're very lucky. I'd like to talk a little bit about the future. You have said that your wife won't run Meriton, your daughters don't want to run Meriton, and you have four grandchildren, and I know some of them are involved in this business. Very good. Why is it hard for rich families to pass on companies, to pass on wealth? Now, here I really don't know about others, I know about myself. For me, I made the company for me. I've given enough money to my children, grandchildren, wives. They have enough money. My main problem is not the family. My main problem is to ensure that the business continues well for me. Mr. Trigoboff, if I was to come back here in 10 or 20 years, who would be sitting opposite me as the head of Meriton? I have no idea. I am looking for somebody. I don't know if I'll ever find anybody who can do it. Might have to sell the company, might have to split it here, there and everywhere. I don't know. I have to discuss it with my daughters, but it's very difficult to find them. You see, my daughter, one is in Israel, one is here, then that one goes there, and this one comes here. I mean, they have to sit down together and start giving me directions. Right. My wife, she doesn't care about the business. She says she's had enough. I've given her enough money. She's happy. So it's between those two daughters. That's all. Do you worry about the future? No, I just plan as well as I can. But I'm more concerned always about the present. I have to succeed at present before I have the future. Mr. Trigoboff, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with me on One Plus One. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for me too. Very nice. One Plus One is available on iView. You can browse the archive or contact us through the website. Stay in touch and leave comments via Facebook. You can also follow me on Twitter. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.